Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast. This is Thought Leaders with Joe Craig. My guest today is Daniel P. Bolger, the author of The Panzer Killers, the untold story of a fighting general and his spearhead tank division's charge into the Third Reich. Daniel P. Bolger, a retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General, was a combat commander in the wars of Afghanistan and Iraq. A top graduate at the Citadel and the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, Bolger earned a Ph.D. in history from the University of Chicago. His military awards include five Bronze Star medals, one for valor, and the Combat Action Badge. He teaches history at North Carolina State University. General Bolger, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Joe. It's great to be here. Well, sir, Maurice Rose is the fighting general referenced in the subtitle. He was respected by his contemporaries as a top-notch tank commander, but he's not well known today. What drew you to his story, and could you give our listeners some background about him? Sure. Like a lot of folks, I had an interest in World War II history when I was growing up. At that time, of course, it had only been about 30 years since the end of the war when I went to college in the 1970s down in Charleston, South Carolina. And so there were quite a few veterans of the war still around. And one of the most senior of the remaining veterans was General Mark Clark. Most people would remember as our U.S. commander in the Italian campaign in World War II. But General Clark knew all those commanders of that era. He had had a hand in picking all of them. So one time when I was a cadet at the Citadel, the college where I went, I had the opportunity to visit General Clark at his home. And General Clark at that time was an elderly person, but he was very much a general. And, you know, he talked, you listened. And he was musing about various commanders that he had had a hand in picking for the war. And he named all the ones you and I would think about, you know, Eisenhower and Patton and Bradley and Ridgeway and Truscott and Collins and all these people. And one of the other cadets that was there with me asked him, he says, well, was there anybody you didn't list before the war who turned out to be a really good commander? And he said, yes, one, Morris Rose. And that sort of stuck in my head. I had to find out. And he mentioned, he said, yeah, most people don't know because he didn't survive the war. You know, he was killed near the end of the war fighting with his troops against the Germans. So a division commander killed in action against the Germans. That really interested me. And I sort of looked a little bit about him in the 1970s. Of course, then I went in the Army, did that for decades. But I never forgot this idea that, you know, this guy had certainly impressed his contemporaries, including very senior people like General Mark Clark. I knew there was something to this story. And, of course, when I found out that Rose had commanded the 3rd Armored Division, one of the most storied units of World War II, I knew there was more to do there. And someday I hope to get to it. And fortunately, I've had that time recently. And the result is the Panzer Killers. Right. And one of the other major figures in the book is Lightning Joe Collins, who was the commander of Seventh Corps. Can you tell us about his challenges in Normandy and how he came to select Rose to lead the 3rd Armored Division? Well, General Joe Collins is generally respected as the best American Corps commander in World War II. And that's saying something because you had Corps commanders like Matthew Ridgway and Walton Walker and others. But Collins had served in the Pacific. He got his nickname because he'd served with the Tropic Lightning Division, 25th Infantry Division, you know, still out in Hawaii and with a brigade up in Alaska today. And so his call sign was Lightning Six, and his troops started calling him Lightning Joe because his first name was Joe Collins. And, you know, everybody needs a good nickname. He was one of the few guys that actually fought in the Pacific and was transferred over to fight in Europe. That wasn't usual, but there were a couple of cases. And because he'd been involved with Guadalcanal and fighting in the Solomons, they thought he knew something about landing operations, which he did. So he was the Corps commander whose troops landed at Utah Beach and then was involved in the initial operations in Normandy. And one of the problems that Collins saw right away, and I think this is where fighting in the jungles in Guadalcanal in New Georgia really stuck in his mind at fighting in the Solomons against Imperial Japanese Army forces. The terrain behind the beach, we always see that, you know, when they have the annual celebration at Normandy or we see Saving Private Ryan or whatever in the movies, we see the open sandy beach at Normandy. And if we focus on anything, we might focus on the bluffs behind a beach like Omaha or Utah, where the German defenders were. But just the other side of those bluffs, there's all these farm fields. Some of them are marshes. Some of them are not. And they're all carved up by hedgerows. And what those are, they've been that way since time of the Middle Ages. Gradually, the various roads were fronted with hedges. And as the hedges grew over time, dirt piled under them until by the time of the Normandy invasion, these things were six to eight feet tall. From the air, it would look like a patchwork quilt. But from the ground, it meant that about every acre was a little German defended fort. And that's what Collins had to break. He was looking for a way to break through that hedgerow. 
And the challenge that he had is that if, if he couldn't figure out a way to do it, we we're going to have to do it with people. We we're going to have to use American riflemen, essentially fighting their way over every hedgerow to get it done. Well, that would have suited the Germans just fine. I think we might still be fighting there, if not for Collins putting together a solution that you and I would call a combined arms solution. Mm -hmm. Aircraft, tanks, infantry, engineers, all working together to crack into these little hedgerow forts and break them. So how did he come to pick Rose to be part of that combined arms solution? Well, he was looking for a good tanker. Collins was an infantry guy, so he knew he needed a tanker because at some point, you know, he could read a map and he realized, hey, we're going to break out of this hedgerow. And when we do, the Germans were more foot mobile than the Americans. Their Air Force had largely been destroyed. Their tanks were subject to bombing by Americans, so they would run short of fuel and stuff. He said, if I can get out of this, I got to have somebody who could launch off in a major operation. And he was looking for American Armored Division to do that. He had two armored divisions ready to go to do the breakout, the second armored division and the third armored division. And the second was very aggressive and well commanded. The third armored division was not so aggressive. The commander was a very nice guy, but he didn't have that fire. And Rose was a one star working in second armored division. And so when the breakout began, Collins, who, you know, he had no time to mess around with people's feelings or anything like that. He saw third wasn't moving fast enough. They had to get out of those hedgerows. And he said, hey, give me that one star from second armored division, that Rose guy. I know him. He'll make things happen. And so Rose was a one star shifted from second and third armored division, put in command during the breakout and served almost the rest of the war under Collins' command. He was Collins' right hand for anything having to do with an armored breakout. And of course, that was a critical capability fighting in Northwest Europe in 1944-45. Absolutely. One of the things I liked in the book, when you described the various options that were out there for command group equipment and personnel and how Rose's choice was, you know, so pared down, really was indicative of his style from leading from the front. How would you contrast that similar style that he and Collins had with that of Courtney Hodges and Omar Bradley? Well, Omar Bradley, of course, 12th Army Group, and initially commanded 1st Army during the invasion for about the first two months of the fighting in France. And then Courtney Hodges, who backfilled Bradley, he was the deputy, and then he fleeted up to take over 1st Army. And that was the army, the field army that commanded Collins 7th Corps, Rose's 3rd Armored Division, all that. So Bradley and Hodges were more like generals you might think of from World War I. They preferred to command from a command post. They used radios and would send messengers forward. If they needed to talk to commanders, they might go to their command post or they might call them back for a meeting. And Hodges in particular preferred to call them to the rear for a meeting. And part of it was both of those guys, and they weren't alone in that. They believed that modern technology made it more useful to stay at a place where your communications were good, and you had a clear mind and all that. Now, people who'd had a little more combat experience, Rose being one of them, Collins, another one we mentioned he'd fought in the Pacific, uh, George Patton, who'd fought in the Mexican punitive expedition and led tanks in World War I. On the other side of the fence, guys like Erwin Rommel, who fought in World War I and earned the Pour la Marite, the, uh, the Blue Max, the highest German award for valor equivalent of the Medal of Honor, Victoria Cross, fighting in World War I. Well, those people with more combat experience, they said, you know, we'll take a radio and we'll take a map, but we'll go forward with our troops because we realize this is going to be a matter of sensing opportunities. And they didn't think, guys like Patton and Rommel and Rose and Collins, they didn't think you could sense that from a command post. So there was a tension there between the command post generals, which were the majority, and these sort of go from the front guys. And there's a risk to going from the front. And Rose exemplified that. I mean, he was eventually killed in action leading his troops from the front. It is a balance, and it's very risky, but that was the situation. Sometimes guys like Rose and Collins had a much better vision of what was going on at the front than people like Bradley and Hodges back in the command post. Well, to bring it to that combat experience on the front down at the tactical level, let's talk about, you know, how did the Shermans, how did they match up against the German tanks they were facing? The general rap you'll always hear is Sherman was outgunned by the German tanks. That's true if you talk about the big German tanks, the ones named after cats, the Panthers and the Tigers, the ones that are always featured in the Hollywood movies, you know, Saving Private Ryan and Fury and all that kind of stuff. The bulk of the German tanks and the Shermans were about the same. The Panzers one through four and all that, Sherman matches up. The Shermans advantage, there were a lot more of them, and they were mechanically reliable with interchangeable parts. Sherman's kept running. So if you looked at an average 
American Armored Division, like the 3rd Armored Division, compared to a German Panzer Division, like, let's say, the 2nd Panzer Division, the Americans would have a lot more of their tanks running, maybe not out of 10 in any given day in the war. The Germans would have about half of them down for maintenance, couldn't get fuel because of the aerial bombing and all this other stuff. But if those Panthers and Tigers worked, they had much heavier armor, much bigger guns, and they could outgun the Sherman. So for a Sherman force, Sherman-equipped force to beat these guys, had to fight a combined arms fight. And this is where people like Morris Rose were really in their element. He understood combined arms warfare. He'd started as an infantryman and served as an infantryman where he was wounded in World War I. He'd switched to cavalry. He'd been involved in all these famous pre-war maneuvers in Louisiana and Tennessee, Carolina. So he knew the value of combined arms, bringing in the American air, bringing in the American engineers, using the great American artillery, which is by far the arm the Germans feared the most was our artillery because it was all weather. It was very responsive and powerful. So Rose figured out a way to do it. Basically, he would never set his tankers up for a fair fight against the German Panthers and Tigers. He'd always bring in all these other combined arms and put the Germans in the situation where they were outnumbered and outgunned down the hole. And therefore, it was never Sherman against Tiger. But in a general sense, the Sherman's super reliable mechanically, plenty of them, but one-on-one -on -one is outgunned by a panther or a tiger. Right. And in addition to the calling in various elements of combined arms warfare, you did see Rose giving feedback to a later letter that came down from Eisenhower in response to news reports that came out that talked about German tanks versus the Americans. Rose ended up famously you know, backing up his men. What kind of changes came out of that exchange? Well, just to show you that even at the highest level, five-star level, General Eisenhower was aware of this problem. And he'd read news reports, even with this wartime censorship, it came through that there was clearly a mismatch. So Eisenhower asked Rose and some other armored commanders, not just Rose, but Rose's answer was particularly eloquent. You mentioned this. Rose sought not just the input of his colonels and his majors and his captains, he went all the way down to the lieutenants, the staff sergeants, and the sergeants who actually commanded these Sherman outfits. And he said, how do you do this? How do you beat them? And they were the ones who bubbled up the answer. Rose knew it. He'd been training and doing it every day in this war. But they're the ones who he quoted going back to Eisenhower. And, you know, at the Eisenhower level, what is he telling Eisenhower? Hey, keep the spare parts coming. Make sure we have time to train and integrate our replacements and our sergeants and officers so that they're ready for this fight. Give us the air power we need, because, of course, that was controlled at Eisenhower's level. You know, the Air Force was part of the Army at that time. Rose controlled exactly no Air Force fighter bombers or heavy right. bombers. So feeding that back to Ike was very important. And for Eisenhower, it was important because it also told him, hey, here's what's going on at the lower level. Don't let these press reports fool you. We've got a solution here. We just need to continue to empower are good combined arms armor commanders like Rose to do the job. All right. Getting back to Rose in the field, in the Ardennes, he was assigned for the first time not with Collins, but with Ridgeway in the 18th Airborne. What was the role of the Spearhead Division during that fight? Well, 18th Airborne Corps, very famous, especially in the Ardennes. The 101st is going to have their great stand at Bastogne. Rose was up closer to the 82nd Airborne, General Jim Gavin, the 82nd, which was helping to hold the North Shoulder. Now, as good as those airborne forces were, I mean, they're magnificent. There's been movies, books, recounts of all their great work. Very brave, very tough, very elite and well-selected and trained, but very lightly armed. There's no tanks, no heavy artillery, anything like that. So Rose becomes the Sunday punch for the 18th Airborne Corps. He's got the tanks. Moreover, he's got the savvy and the knowledge with both himself and his subordinate battalion commanders, his subordinate tank commanders. They know how to fight German panzers. They've been doing it since they came ashore in Normandy. And in Rose's case, he'd also fought in North Africa and in Sicily. So Ridgeway counts on Rose to stop the main German effort to cross the Meuse River which was the German intent in the Battle of the Bulls. They wanted to cross the Meuse River, split the British from Americans, maybe even take the Great Port of Antwerp back, and basically create havoc in the Allied lines by splitting the British in the north from the Americans in the south. And it's square in the middle of that attack is Morris Rose. And, of course, the main effort in that is being led by German 2nd SS Panzer Division, one of the top German divisions, and officered by these ruthless Waffen-SS guys, very 
highly steeped in Nazi propaganda and all that. I mean, you think of Morris Rose, who's a professional American soldier, but also a Jewish American. I mean, this is like the ultimate enemy for him to face. This is why he's fighting this war. And that's who he's up against. So in a lot of ways, Bridgeway, who didn't really know much about Rose's background, picked the exact right guy in the exact right formation in the exact right place to stop these German SS Panzer guns. And after Rose and his colleagues did stop them, you know, they get through the Battle of the Bulge, they get through the flooding of the Ruhr Dams. Then you have Rose and, and Spearhead leading the drive to Cologne. Can you tell the listeners uh, about the significance of that drive? Yeah, very important. Of course, Cologne is one of the biggest cities in Germany. It had been bombed heavily and was largely depopulated by the spring of 45. Cologne sits on the Rhine River. And all the way back in history, going all the way back to the times of the old Germanic tribes fighting the Roman legions, the Rhine was always known as the boundary of Germany. Once you penetrated the Rhine, there was really nothing else that was going to hold you up from overrunning Germany. And the Rhine River is a massive river. I mean, we shouldn't think of this as some of these little, you know, one foot deepers we have here in the United States. The Rhine at that point is like a half a mile wide. It was spring flood. It's a deep river, fast flowing. So Cologne was important because there was a bridge. There, there was a big bridge called the Hohenzollern Bridge, named after the old dynasty that was like Kaiser Wilhelm's family and all that, World War I. And the thought was, if we can take Cologne, if the Americans could take Cologne, grab that bridge, we can start punching forces across the Rhine. So that was the importance of taking Cologne, not just to take a target. The city had been bombed and all that, but to get to the Rhine River and take that bridge. And if you did get to the Rhine River, you'd cut off any German forces. And there was a lot of them, especially the people who were on foot, stuck on the west side of the Rhine. It would really be a big step down the war. So seizing Cologne was real important. And of course, as we know, and Morris Rosen and his troopers certainly knew this, the last thing you want to do is give the Germans time to dig in in a city. The 3rd Armored Division had been involved with the 1st Infantry Division and other forces fighting in Aachen the previous fall, the city of Aachen, right on the German border. So an urban fight against the Germans, bad news. I mean, you know, you didn't want that at all. So quick lunge to the river, fight your way through quickly, penetrate to the river and take that bridge. They got everything done except the bridge. The Germans literally blew the bridge right in the face of the lead tanks of the 3rd Armored Division. So they right. did not get the bridge. Obviously, they did eventually get over the Rhine. And at that point, you got Third Armored racing through Germany. When they are, you know, called to stop, they shift north in order to close the Ruhr pocket. They're uh, headed up towards uh, this town called Paderborn. Proved to be a moment of both triumph and tragedy. Can you just elaborate on that for our listeners? Once they get across the Rhine, a bridge had been seized at Remagen by the Ninth Armored Division, also part of First Army. So they had grabbed a key bridge. After they got that in, American engineers bridged the rest of the river. There was also a crossing in the north under Montgomery. Patton crossed. General Alexander Patch, Sandy Patch with 7th Army crossed. The French crossed way in the south near the Alps. So now you got all the Allied armies on the other side of the Rhine tearing up the Germans. The war is clearly in its last weeks. Rose and the 3rd Armored Division are given the mission of spearheading the 7th Corps operation. That's why they're called the Spearhead Division. To encircle the Ruhr Basin. Uh, the last remaining industrial facilities in Germany where they were cranking out ammunition and vehicles and all that. And the last area where a big German army was located, a big army group, in fact. And so as they're leading out, they're given the mission to go to the city of Paderborn. And it was almost 100 miles ahead of where they were at when they launched out on the last days of March of 1945. So, again, war's almost over. Paderborn is going to be the site of their link up with the American Ninth Army coming around from the north side of the Ruhr, what would be the Ruhr Valley pocket. And Rose in the lead, as usual, he's leading his troops. They managed to make almost 100 miles. And the next day, they're just outside Paderborn. The next day, all they got to do is get to Paderborn by nightfall. Right in front of them, the intel people didn't pick it up. It's found by American forces that bang into them is a German SS heavy tank battalion, Waffen SS. These tankers were armed with Tigers, the big tanks, the ones that were tough to destroy. They're fanatic. Even though the war is almost over, these people are going to fight, and they're on the outskirts of Paderborn. And that's what the 3rd Armored Division's lead tank forces and infantry forces bang into on the afternoon of Friday, March 30th of 1945. Mm -hmm. A good Friday. Good Friday on the Christian calendar. And Jewish-American Morris Rose, it's also almost Passover there, he's leading on that Friday, on that Passover Friday, he's 
leading one of the columns, and he's very far forward. He's in a Jeep, quarter-ton vehicle, you know, unarmored, as was his way. I mean, he had a big radio board, but he would get up forward and he could get around, and that's a very maneuverable vehicle. But it doesn't stand a chance when it confronts a platoon of tigers. And the vehicle's crunched against a tree. Rose dismounts. According to the survivors, surviving Americans, Rose was trying to surrender to the tank commander. It's not clear the German tank commander understood what the heck was going on. He just pulled out a submachine gun and started shooting. And Rose was the tallest and most obvious target. It was dark. It was already nightfall. Mm -hmm. They shot him. The Germans never searched Rose. They didn't even pick up his two-star helmet. They never checked his pockets or his vehicle for all the maps and classified material that was there. As far as we can tell, it was just a bad situation for Rose. And the other Americans did survive, although several were wounded and a few were taken prisoner. Yeah, and you know, the tragedy, as you mentioned, it was just a few weeks before the end of the war. I believe he was you know, one of the highest ranking officers to die from enemy fire. How was the news of his death you know, received back home in the military, and how is he remembered today? Well, obviously, the U.S. military did release his death, did release the casualty information. He was honored with a, despite the war, the senior leaders actually spent time, came off the line, and they had a ceremony where he was buried with full military honors in the U.S. military cemetery. He still remains buried in Europe today with his soldiers. And at that funeral, among the people there, Omar Bradley, Courtney Hodges, Joe Collins, George Patton, who came up from the 3rd Army in the South for that funeral, he knew Rose well and had picked him for his first star. So they did commemorate it. They renamed the Ruhr Pocket the Rose Pocket. There'd later be a troop ship named after Rose. There's Rose Barracks in Germany. There's an Army Reserve Training Center in Connecticut. His family was originally from Connecticut. There's a veterans hospital in Denver, Colorado, where the Rose family had settled and where Rose initially joined the Colorado National Guard right before World War I. So he's been commemorated. And the American Jewish community in particular really took it to heart because they recognized that who they were fighting by this time. The tragic depth of the Holocaust had come home to the American people with video and film. A lot of it wasn't even shown in public. It was so horrific. But it was well known what the Nazis had been doing by this point. And here's Morris Rose, an American of the Jewish religion, who's fighting at the head of his troops and killed by the Germans. So I think it was a great story of heroism and, like all deaths in war, a tragedy for the family and for those who supported it. Well, and hopefully your new book will help lead to that effort to remember Morris Rose and, and his legacy. And I just want to thank you, General Bolger, for being our guest today. I want to remind our listeners that his new book is The Panzer Killers, The Untold Story of a Fighting General and His Spearhead Tank Division's Charge into the Third Reich. So again, thanks for being our guest. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army Day. Hua.